Hello, I've gotten a request to do some videos about strain gauges, and so this is the first of those videos. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what a strain gauge is and kind of how it works, and then either at the end of this video or uh, the next one, probably the next one, I'll tell you how we use them and how we do bridge circuits. So let's start with the basics of a strain gauge. Um, a strain gauge basically works on the principle that if you stretch a wire, its resistance goes up, and if you shorten a wire, its resistance goes down. It's too hard to show you an actual wire, so I've got a piece of latex tubing here. You can see I've put two marks on it right there, and this is just done with a pen. If I stretch it out like that, a couple of things happen. You know, it gets longer, and it, the diameter goes down. In fact, if I really stretch it out, the diameter goes down a lot. Now, the elastic modulus of this is essentially zero compared with metal, and this is also doesn't conduct electricity. So this. It doesn't make a good strain gauge by itself, but it actually you can make a pretty good strain gauge with uh, latex tubing, and I'll tell you how here in a little bit. That's foreshadowing. Um, what I'd like to start by doing is uh, talking about how you calculate the resistance of a wire. Okay, the, re the expression for resistance of a wire R is rho A over L, where A is the cross-sectional area and L is the length. Rho is a material property. It's called resistivity. And you, you, you look this up. It's like you look this up just as you would density or elastic modulus or yield stress. It's just it's a property of the material. And let's let's take an example here. Let's take a little wire. And uh, I'm definitely going to do this in metric units. Sorry for all you English unit fans out there. There's there's no room for English units in this in this world now. Um, Let's, let's just take a little short piece of wire, one meter long. So it's about yeah, that long. Okay. Now, very small diameter. Diameter is 0 0.1 millimeters. And the material will be copper. All right. So we're going to need a couple of things here. We're going to need to know the elastic modulus. We're going to know the resistivity. And we're going to need to know an allowable uh, uh, stress. Okay, so just you, those are the things you look up. So the resistivity for a copper wire rho is. I'm going to look this up here now. It is. Dang, where did I put it? Up oh, there it is. Okay, 1.68 times 10 to the minus 6 ohm centimeters. That's kind of a funny unit, but that's what it is. Okay, E is easy. Um, e is 110 GPA. So that puts it right in between aluminum, which is around 70, and steel, which is about 205. So we need that, we need that, and let's, let's make an allowable stress. I think they call that 200 megapascals. Okay, that's a P, not an R. Whoops. Okay, so those are the material properties we're going to need. Well, the diameter is that A is, and I just, I'll just work this out here for you. It's uh, 7.854 times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared. Now, if there's anything wrong with metric units, and there isn't generally, it's that you get numbers like this. In, if there is any advantage to English units, it's that you get, you're working with human sized units, you know, an inch is about like that. My foot really is about a foot long, you know. It's about like that. They're, they're, they're the size of human beings, basically. So when human beings build human-sized things, you get reasonable numbers. A millimeter is this little tiny thing, okay? and a meter is great big. So if I have a, a piece of wire that's a tenth of a millimeter in diameter, which is very, very small, and I express the cross-sectional area in meters, which is really big, I get you know, parts per billion. Well, in the English units, Parts per billion of anything makes you wonder. It's, it's unusual to get numbers of that magnitude that actually mean anything. In metric units, it happens all the time. Okay? Now, if you want, you can express this in millimeters squared, but you're still going to have to work with pascals and things. Best to keep consistent units and just live with these really, really big and really, really small numbers. So in the same set of calculations, I'm going to have 110 billion and 7.85 billions. Okay? It's, just, it's the price of doing business in the metric system. So anyway, got all this stuff here. If I work this out, plug all those numbers into there, I'm going to get the resistance of that wire, and it comes out to 4.278 ohms. 
Okay? Now that's not very much. You know, a kilo ohm resistor, a thousand ohms, is not particularly high. And mega ohm resistors are fairly routine. So this is a very low resistance. And it makes sense. You want wires to have low resistance. That's they're not trying to heat them, you're trying to get them to carry electricity. So it's good that they have low resistance. Now, what, were, what if we were to stretch this wire a little bit? Okay? This is the big the, the, the uh, underlying idea on strain gauges. If I were to take a wire, where'd my wire go? If I were to take a wire, let's pretend this is my wire, and stick it to the board, okay? And I mean stick it everywhere, glue it on so the entire wire is glued to the board, and then some load were applied to the board that changed the shape of the board, that induced a strain in the board, the wire would mirror that strain. Now the assumption is the stiffness of the gauge is insignificant compared to the stiffness of the part that it's mounted on. So if I take this relatively flexible little wire and mount it to this great big board and then deform the board, I can assume that the wire is going to do whatever the board's going to do and the, the presence of the wire does not change the behavior of the board. Okay? And as the wire gets longer, as the board uh, ex uh, expands, board gets shorter. It's tough to do this, but you can imagine getting shorter. As the, uh, as the board contracts, its resistance changes. And that's the key. By sticking a wire to a structure and then measuring the resistance through that wire, if the structure expands, because of tension or because of thermal stresses, the resistance will go up. If the wire contracts because of compression or thermal contraction because the temperature is going down, the resistance goes down. So all you need to be able to do is measure the resistance of that wire and with a little bit of calibration work you can then figure out what the strain is. So that's what a strain gauge is. Now, the higher the resistance, the better off you are. The more wire you can put in your strain gauge, the more accurate it's going to be. Now, it's tough to find examples where you can put a big long wire on a structure and have it still be useful. So the way strain gauges are made is they've got a little, usually plastic substrate, a little plastic sheet, and they, they print a wire grid on it. Okay? And they, they used to call these metal foil resistors. They were actually originally done as resistors. And there's usually a solder pad right there so you can solder a larger wire to it. But what this does, going back and forth and back and forth like that, is it lets you put a whole lot of wire in a small space. So I don't know if I can do that here, but it would be like, here, let's see if I can do this. There. It's like that. Okay? Now I've got the same amount of wire in a very small space, and as I stretch it, I can stretch a very small loop here, and I'm stretching the entire piece of this rubber tubing. That's equivalent to what's going on here. By folding it over like this, you put a lot of wire in a small space. Okay, res strain gauges come basically in two resistances. Every strain gauge I've ever seen is either 120 ohms or 350 ohms. Those are the two standard resistances. If you see something other than that, it's probably an unusual application. Now, I don't have statistically meaningful personal experience. It's all anecdotal. That said, I've never seen anything other than a 120 or a 350. There may be some. Okay, so let's, let's go one step further here. What if I take that same piece of wire and I apply a load to it? Now, I've worked it out. If I apply a load, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if I apply a load, I want it to be smaller than the, the yield stress of the material. That's why I picked that allowable to be 200 megapascals. So if I do that and work this out, I get force is really small. It's uh, 1.571 newtons. Okay, it's a really small wire, so it stands to reason it wouldn't take much force to uh, get it to its allowable stress, and that's what this is. So. Here I've got this, this piece of wire, it's copper, it's got a diameter of 0.1 millimeters, very small wire. With this force on it, it's going to stretch. Right? So as it stretches, let's find out what its change in resistance is. Well, let's see. Stress is F over A, and I already know that's 200 megapascals. That's how I work that number out. Okay, And I also know that stress equals the elastic modulus times strain, so strain equals stress over E. All right, so far so good. When you work that out, you get my strain 
to be 1.818 times 10 to the minus third. Now that's unitless, but you could also call that millimeters per millimeter, if you prefer. That's right, or meters per meter, or furlongs per furlong, it doesn't matter. Or sometimes we call that 1818 micro strain. You'll see that a lot too. Okay? So when I do that, that tells me change in length over length. That's, that's how I figure out what the uh, uh, change in length of the uh, overall change in length of the uh, uh, wire is going to be. And that's going to be in uh, millimeters. Okay? About 1.8 millimeters. So if I look at that, here, let's see. So delta L equals epsilon L. Well, L is 1. So that's also the change in length in meters. So what I can do now is I can say R, I'll call that prime maybe, is rho. Uh, let's see. Make sure I do this right here. L plus delta L over A. And if I do that, I get some number here. Okay, and then did I work that out? I guess I didn't work that out. The reason I didn't work that out is because A also changes, right? There is a Poisson's ratio. Poisson's ratio says that as my wire stretches, the diameter goes down. I have to account for that or I'm not going to get the right answer. So when we do that, we need to know what the Poisson's ratio for copper is. And it turns out, that's another one of these material uh, properties, for cold drawn copper wire, which is what I assumed I'm using, that's Poisson's ratio. So that's not right. We've got to fix that. Right? Since Poisson's ratio is the ratio of lateral strain to longitudinal strain, the minus sign in it, that's Poisson's ratio. I know that the lateral strain is a little more than a third of the longitudinal strain. So I'm going to have the diameter go down in proportion as the length goes up. So that my, uh, my new area, and I'll call that area prime, equals pi over 4 times uh, my new diameter squared. Okay? Let's, let's actually write this a different way. Diameter minus delta diameter. And the delta times the diameter is given by that. Okay? When I do that, I get another number here. And that's 7.844 times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared. And if you remember, I had 7.854 before. So it's gone down just a little bit. And R prime, which is now the, the uh, resistance I get, having applied this load and having the wire get longer, turns out to be rho, uh, let's see, was it rho? Having a stupid attack here. L plus delta L, and that's, uh, let's see, A minus delta A, I guess we'll call it like that, right? The area goes down. When I do that, I get a very slightly smaller number, okay? Whereas I got, um, let's see, 4.278 before. This time, I'm going to get 4.292 ohms, okay? The resistance has gone up just a little, and that's where I'm going to leave off here, and that's where I have to start on the next video. The change in resistance is small. It's very small. So in order for this to be a useful uh, sensor, I have to be able to determine very small changes in resistance. That's where the bridge circuit comes in. That's where we're going to go next.